welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Goddard. I'm president of the RCP, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome you here to say happy birthday to Ash. Um, we've got people clearly both here in the room in the Dorchester Library, uh, and we've also got people joining us virtually. Um, but as always, it's great to see people in the room. Um, from a housekeeping perspective, we are not expecting any fire alarms. So if it goes off, sadly, we will have to respond. Uh, and then if people just make their way down the stairs and out into the front car park, uh, that will be the safest thing. If people can keep their mask on unless they are speaking, that would be helpful too. This is, as you can feel from the temperature of the room, this is a very well air conditioned room uh, for the book's sake, but actually from a uh, health infection prevention and control perspective, it also helps as well. So it is 50 years since the RCP set up ASH in 1971. But the purpose of today is, is not only to look back, uh, but it's also to look forward to see what is next from the point of view of tobacco control. And I'm delighted that there are so many of the UK's uh, experts and health service leaders uh, that are going to join us over the course of the afternoon. So how did this story start? Well, following Doll and Hill's discovery of the link between smoking and lung cancer, uh, which was in the 1940s, and their seminal paper in the 19, 1950, it became clear to most physicians that government wasn't going to do anything about it if they didn't have to. Uh, and there was various lobbying that went on uh, in the 60s, uh, including uh, the Standing Advisory Committee on Radiotherapy and Cancer, and the Health Minister at the time, Ian McLeod, became convinced of the link between smoking and lung cancer. In 1954, the government of the time actually gave the MRC 250,000 to look into it uh, and held a press conference at that time to announce that funding. Sadly, perhaps, though, the message of that conference was slightly undermined by the fact that Ian McLeod chain-smoked throughout the meeting. But on the brighter side, that money came from the tobacco industry. That 250000 came from it. So that was the first example, if you like, of the polluter pays. Um, but none of that led to a reduction in smoking. Uh, and it was really felt that the profession therefore had to intervene at that point. And step forward, a fellow of the college, Charles Fletcher, uh, who was a respected chess physician at the time. And I've been listening to some audio files of, of his reflections that he recorded uh, in the early 80s. And, it, it, and it's fascinating to hear the clarity of his thought, uh, his clear ability as a communicator, uh, and from what we've all seen, his ability to change hearts and minds. And, you know, and that, the... He was well known because he fronted uh, your life in their hands, let's get the right way around, on television. So uh, we must thank Charles Fletcher for his interventions uh, and also for his uh, relationship and friendship with Dolan Hill. Um, so he then managed to persuade the president of the RCP in 1957, who was Robert Platt, who was also instigated this building and this library that you're sitting in, to get the RCP to undertake an inquiry into smoking. Now, a few weeks ago, we learned from Steve Woodward, who uh, is the former director of ASH in Australia, and I think many of you know, uh, he had an email from Professor John Martin, who is apparently 99 now, uh, and he said that actually he and a few colleagues wrote to the RCP in 1957 to do get us to try and do something about smoking. So I think we're still trying just to explore that and whether history will tell us that it was uh, John Martin or Charles Fletcher that really pushed the college into doing it. I would hope it was both. But anyway, Platt was the right man at the right time. Platt really was the sort of character who, once he believed in something, would drive it through. And as you can imagine, when the college was on Trafalgar Square, we were in what is now Canada House, trying to convince the fellowship to move to what was a bomb site into a building which had mixed reviews uh, was not without its challenges, but he, he was a man that did. Um, so he then chaired a committee looking into the relationship between smoking and lung cancer and employed 
Charles Fletcher as the Honorary Secretary. And they produced that groundbreaking report, Smoking and Health, in 1962, which I'm sure you've all read it. But if you haven't, it's just remarkable going through that report how much of it is true today. And really, from the point of view of evidence and how we can influence the agenda on tobacco control, it is a seminal tone. Um, but Ash and the college have continued to produce reports which have hopefully kept the evidence base up to speed. Uh, and in 1971, the second report, Smoking and Health Now, good title there, whoever came up with that one, was published and ASH was formed. Uh, so thankfully we've got Lord Young here, who's going to take over from me in a couple of minutes and talk about the early days of ASH from a political perspective uh, and focusing hopefully on tobacco policy. But the RCP and ASH have continued to work over those 50 years. Um, and I think it's fair to say that that sort of energy was reactivated in 1997 by us setting up the Tobacco Advisory Group here at the college. And that was led by John Britton. Now, I've known John for many, many years. I was a, a, a medical registrar in Nottingham City, uh, and there was this esteemed figure uh, who was brilliant fun to do post-state wardrobes with, by the way, uh, and a superb physician, as well as somebody who feels as passionately about this as anybody else. And I think the other person who was key at that time, who many of you know, and who's quietly sitting at the back, is Linda Cuthbertson, who was at the time tobacco communications lead for the BMA. We poached her, uh, and she's had an extraordinary career here. I have, throughout my 19 years with the college, uh, always been able to rely on Linda as a voice of reason, voice of common sense, and how to tell me to get stuff done. Um, and John Britton, then liaised with the then president of the RCP, who was George Alberti, to set up the Tobacco Advice Group. George was sympathetic uh, and gave them money, and away we went. So over the past 20 years, with John as chair, Linda as secretary, you will know that TAG has produced many seminal reports which have continued to drive this agenda forward. Now, John, a couple of years ago, stood back from chair, and Sanjay, Agarwal sitting over there, took over, uh, and has been as energetic and as passionate an advocate for this agenda as John was. Um, and I've really enjoyed working with Sanjay over the past couple of years. Uh, and you'll be aware that yet again this year we produced another smoking and health report, which really touched a nerve at a time when it perhaps needed to. I think we have been a bit distracted. I don't mean that in to, to un, underplay COVID, which has really changed how all of us live and think about medicine. But it is really good just to remember the harm that tobacco does and the importance of public health from a not just COVID perspective. Uh, so I, th I would like to thank Sanjay and all the team for everything that they've done this year uh, to really show that TAG and ASH are going to continue to push on what is a very, very important agenda. So I've talked enough. I will now hand over to Lord Young, uh, who is going to give us his perspective on ASH's role. Now, uh, Lord Young is probably 50th anniversary of your, your parliamentary time. Uh, and as I understand it, your first uh, government post was Public Health Minister in 1979 to 81. Um, and perhaps an open secret at the time that he was moved out of that post uh, by the then uh, Prime Minister, uh, one Margaret Thatcher, um, because uh, he was perhaps a bit too loud a voice when it came to tobacco control. And many cynically are not then surprised that uh, Baroness Thatcher then became a consultant for Philip Morris. Uh, Lord Young has served under five Prime Ministers uh, and he's held a number of very critical roles in government, Leader of the House of Commons, Lord Privy Seal, Chief Whip. So nobody perhaps is better qualified to talk about the machinations of politics in what is undoubtedly a political topic. Lord Young. Andrew, thank you very much and it's a real honor to speak at this 50th um, commemorative anniversary and to 
pay tribute to the Royal College and to Ash for their long-standing campaign against the tobacco industry and with so many achievements under their collective um, belt. Um, I think it's been a very successful partnership between the Royal College, bringing with it the, the weight, the credibility of medical and scientific um, opinion, and Ash, the fleet-footed, media-savvy, well-connected um, campaigning organization. And in the combat against the forces of darkness, uh, Ash is the 007 to uh, um, RCPM's, RCP's M. Um, the Royal College's commitment to public health is um, long-standing. In 1725, it made representations to the House of Commons about the disastrous consequences of the rising consumption of cheap gin and actually initiated legislation that uh, brought the abuse under control. Over 200 years later, I came across the following exchange in the House of Commons on November the 28th, 1932. And the quest question was about coal tar on roads, which was then thought to be the principal cause of cancer. And um, a backbencher asked the question, is not smoking one of the greatest contributory causes of cancer? And will that question also be examined? Now, the reply was given by Sir Hilton Young, uh, who happens to be my great uncle and succeeded Neville Chamberlain as Minister for Health in 1932. And what he said, I should like to give an accurate answer to that question, though it does not arise from the question on the paper. Perhaps my honorable and gallant friend will give me notice of the question. Well, uh, his great nephew took up the cudgels uh, 40 years later. And my interest in the subject is due in part to Keith Ball, whom some of you will remember, a co-founder of ASH, then its chairman, and a force behind the 1962 report. And also, as Andrew has said, uh, Charles Fletcher, uh, whose daughter Susanna married a very good friend of mine and uh, former MP Nick Lyle. Keith was actually a constituent of mine in Ealing Acton and a cardiologist at the Middlesex. And he took me around the oncology uh, ward at the hospital and it made a lasting impression. And I was looking at my first election address in February 1974 and I committed myself to getting greater government support for cancer research saying, if government spent as much on this as Concord, shows what a long time ago it was, we would have cracked it by now. We must get our priorities right. And I remember going to Keith's 80th birthday party at the Middlesex in 1996, and a huge cake with 80 candles was wheeled into the room. But the candles couldn't be lit because there was no one in the room who had a box of matches or a lighter. I became an MP in 1974 and became a founder member of the all-party parliamentary group, which was set up in 1976, along with uh, a Labour MP, Laurie Pavitt, uh, whose private members' bills to ban tobacco advertising and sponsorship were regularly talked out. And ranged against us at the time were not just the MPs who had tobacco manufacturing in their constituencies, Bristol, Nottingham, and many others, but also MPs financed by the tobacco industry to obstruct legislation. And in my first parliament, David Owen, uh, the health minister, fought a brave campaign. And if you read his autobiography, it reveals his frustration when he tried unsuccessfully to use the Medicines Act to replace voluntary with statutory regulation of the tobacco industry. And then in 1979, I, beca I became a junior health minister and had the opportunity to put my election address into effect. And I spoke at the World Conference on Tobacco and Health in Stockholm, I'm sorry, tobacco or health, in Stockholm in 1979, despite being warned by my departments not to go. And I said this, the general proposition that I wish to put to you is that the solution to many of today's medical problems will not be found in the research laboratories of our hospitals, but in our parliaments. A slightly different emphasis to my original election address. And my immediate battle was over the voluntary agreement with the tobacco industry on sponsorship, which was about to expire. Uh, sponsorship, sponsorship got round the original ban on TV advertising in the 60s. And I learned from early on with my negotiations with the Tobacco Advisory Council, TAC, or the TMA as it now is, that what they really feared was smoking being portrayed as a dirty antisocial habit. 
And hence their sponsorship campaigns were all about respectability, glamour, success, and sophistication. Uh, black tie concerts, fireworks at Leeds Castle, sponsorship of uh, Glyndebourne, test matches at Lords, the Marlborough Grand Prix, Brie, uh, Aldborough Ballet Rombert, carefully selected guests, including civil servants and ministers. And their allies with the advertising industry worried that alcohol and unhealthy foods might be the next target threatening core elements of their business. And on advertising, I remember the case put to me was that this was all about brand switching and facilitating the promotion of less lethal brands, not promoting the product or growing the market. I never bought that argument, not least because at exactly the same time, I was being told by other advertising agencies that toothpaste advertisements didn't just promote a brand, but had a broader impact of wider benefit, namely promoting oral hygiene. And so my emphasis throughout the discussions was not on glamour, but on lung cancer, bronchitis, and heart disease, and the risks from passive smoking. And during negotiations with the TAC, they came up with an our famous objection to my proposal to put the health warning on the cigarette as well as the pack, telling me that the ink was carcinogenic. Now, the support that Ash gave me at that time was absolutely crucial. I actually relied on Ash for briefing as much as my civil servants. And curry lunches with David Simpson, whom I'm delighted to see here, off the uh, to Tottenham Court Road, kept my morale high, while the tobacco industry portrayed me as an obsessive and a fanatic. And throughout my time as an MP, and indeed now as a peer, the role of Ash in providing external evidence and support to parliamentarians was absolutely crucial. We don't have the resources on our own to pursue issues without support from groups like Ash, providing evidence, providing information, and helping to build parliamentary alliances. And as MPs, we have an interest in what our constituents think, and the role of Ash there was crucial in shaping and then articulating public opinion. And it countered the relentless propaganda from the industry and helped persuade MPs that measures against smoking were actually popular. My battle against the TAC was not my only battle as a health minister. The concierge at Alexander Fleming House, situated at the Elephant and Castle, um, was a chain smoker. So the first impression any visitor got to visiting the Department of Health and Social Security was a cloud of smoke from his cubicle. This was long before we had any security. And I tried to get him moved because of the damage being done to the image of my department and found myself embattled with his trade union. Uh, there were no complaints about the way he performed his job. It was not a no-smoking area. His terms and conditions of employment didn't say he had to be a non-smoker. Uh, and I left the department uh, before he did. Uh, before I was moved, as Andrew has just said, uh, allegedly after the industry lobbied Dennis Thatcher, who persuaded his wife that I was a disruptive member of her administration, I had a plan to um, introduce a health bill drawn widely enough to have an amendment to replace the voluntary agreement on health warnings with statutory legislation. But the bill was dropped when I left, and my successors from the more libertarian wing of my party had no appetite for the fight. Let me fast forward 25 years to possibly the most significant step in the campaign against tobacco, the ban on smoking in public places, which finally came into force in England in 2007. We were the last nation in the UK to do so. Uh, politicians in the devolved nations were more supportive, and their legislation passed without difficulty, but not so in Westminster. And here, an unsung hero is Kevin Barron, Labour MP, and his Health Select Committee, who overcame the resistance of Labour health ministers such as uh, John Reid. And when Tony Blair made Kevin chairman of the Health Select Committee, Kevin told Deborah that his top priority was an inquiry into smoke-free laws to help get his party in the right place on legislation. He needed her help, which Deborah gave him. The RCP had already produced a major report on smoke-free laws, and the chair of the Tobacco Advisory Group, John Britton, was made advisor to the committee on the inquiry. And after the committee published its report, Ash had the amendments to, to Health Bill drafted for Kevin, which he persuaded his entire committee uh, to support, to remove the exemption for pubs and clubs. And Ash organized the lobbying, the briefing of MPs in support of the amendments, 
coordinating other groups, the Royal College, the BMA, and Cancer Research. And I recall a farcical debate in standing committee on the bill when the government tried to exempt food pubs that didn't sell food. And we had debates as to whether an apple on the counter from the tree in the pub garden counted as food. And on one key division, the government was saved from defeat on this issue by a Scottish Labour MP voting to allow smoking in pubs in England when it had already been banned in Scotland and actually overturning the wish of English MPs on that committee. And with Andrew Lansley, uh, my party's shadow health minister at the time, we persuaded David Cameron to allow a free vote when the bill returned from its committee stage to the floor of the House. And this was crucial because in so doing, Kevin was able to persuade Labour to do exactly the same. And as a result, the amendments were won with a 200 majority on a free vote in a parliament where Labour's majority was uh, 66. So looking back on the changes since 74, we now have a powerful all-party parliamentary group with 29 members of both houses and all parties led by Bob Blackman, ably serviced by Ash, and only a handful of MPs and peers on the dark side and no tobacco manufacturing in the UK. So what of the future? Because there are still battles to be won. We didn't get what we wanted on non-smoking areas for pavement licenses during the pandemic. And tobacco is still as affordable in real terms as it was in the 1960s. So we must maintain the pressure. We have a new organization as a successor to Public Health England, the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities, housed in the DOH, uh, of which we have high expectations. And I'm delighted to see on the panel today the CMO and senior representatives from OHID as well as the health inequalities lead from the NHS, and I look forward to hearing from them what they plan to achieve. Uh, the challenges they face are tough. The public health budget has had severe cuts in no way compensated for by recent welcome increases. We have a new public health minister, Maggie Throop, who made a positive response to a recent debate in the Commons, whom we must get to know better. And we await with interest the promised tobacco control plan. And crucially, we must win the battle to make the polluter pay. The tobacco transnationals are responsible for the epidemic which killed many millions of people in the 20th century and they continue to profit from their lethal products to this day. Big tobacco can and should be made to provide the funding to make smoking obsolete and bring the epidemic to a close. So, uh, well done Ash, well done the Royal College and let your achievements be a springboard to further success. Thank you. Thank you, Laura DeYoung. Right, we're now going to test uh, our virtual uh, abilities, and I'm going to hand over to Sir Richard Pito, who I'm sure uh, needs no introduction, particularly from me, uh, and can be safely described as one of the world's greatest epidemiologists. Uh, as I suspect many will know, uh, Richard joined the other Sir Richard, Doll, uh, when Austin Bradford Hill retired to carry on their signature studies of the risks of tobacco. He knew Charles Fletcher, uh, and in addition to numerous awards and prizes, uh, I think everybody knows he's a superb public communicator on this issue. So I will hand over to Sir Richard, all being well. <laughs> well, could you just indicate whether you can hear me, please? We can now hear you. That's great. And I hope you can also see the first slide. Can indeed. What I wanted to do is to run over some of the health evidence, because we're talking, I mean, it's absolutely essential to get the policies right. The health evidence has been clear for more than 50 years, and the, the real need is action. And the previous speaker is a better place than anybody else to talk about that. But I want to go back to the health evidence, um, although it's, in a way, old evidence, because the numbers are so shocking and people do forget them. I mean, tobacco is extraordinary. It is, it's, it's, well, it's unique in the amount of damage it does. And I want to just look back. I've marked the 1970s and the 2010s on this graph. And this, it looks like a packet of cigarettes, but it actually it isn't. Each one of these is the probability that a 35 year old man would die before age 70. And the shaded part is the amount, is the mortality from tobacco, the number of deaths from tobacco. And you can see by the 1960s, 
um, at the time of the Royal College of Physicians report. Um, uh, more than half of all the deaths in middle-aged men in Britain were due to tobacco. That one thing was causing more than half of all deaths in middle age. And as you can see, the probability of dying in middle age is much lower now than it was in the 1960s. It's gone down. But if you look at the shaded bars, the main reason it's gone down is because of the decrease in tobacco deaths. And this isn't entirely fair. You know, the improvements in the treatment of heart disease, for example, will reduce the number of tobacco deaths from heart disease. So this is treatment as well as prevention. But it's gone down from being more than half of all deaths, about a quarter of all the population would be killed by tobacco before they're 70 at 1960s death rates, to being about a quarter of all deaths, well, in middle age. Our defined middle age is 35 to 69. And if we look at the results of women, you see that the, Britain was the first country where men really smoked seriously. And so we were the first country where we had really high death rates from tobacco in middle age. At that time, we had the worst death rates in the world from tobacco. And of course, we've had one of the best decreases in tobacco deaths in the world since then. But it's easy to have the best decrease in the world if you start off with the worst death rates. Um, here's the same thing for women. And the women started to smoke after men, so their peak mortality was in the 1980s, not in the 1960s. But again, it's gone down. But still, it's a quarter of the deaths in middle age. A quarter of all deaths in middle age is important. And if we look at the men and the women side by side, this is just looking at the relative importance of deaths in middle age. In Britain, in the mid-2010s, there weren't very many deaths before middle age. Well, there still aren't. Um, men here, 7,000. Women, 4,000. Um, but then you start getting appreciable numbers of deaths in middle age, and tobacco is still an appreciable fraction of that. It's, a, it's about a quarter of the deaths in middle age and a substantial fraction of the deaths in old age. So overall, we're talking about something like 120,000 deaths a year from tobacco out of a total of 600,000. So about one fifth of all the deaths in Britain. That's the situation now after those decreases. You know, the good news is it was much worse. Since the 1970s, we've had a threefold decrease in the prevalence of smoking, a threefold decrease in cigarette sales, and a threefold decrease in, in, the, in tobacco deaths. Okay, I want to jump back to some of the evidence underlying this. And while I'm, while I'm talking about numbers, over the last 50 years, these numbers are in the booklet which um, accompanies this meeting, which is really excellent. Very often booklets and meetings aren't well written. This one is extremely well written. I didn't have anything to do with writing it, um, except the supplies and numbers. Um, but it says that the total number of deaths from tobacco in the 50 years since ash was founded has been in this country alone, just 8 million. That's 5 million men, 3 million women. And still, we're getting we're getting about a million deaths per decade. So in, over the next 20 years, we'll have about 2 million deaths if people keep on smoking where they are now. And those people who are going to die from tobacco over the next 20 years are already smoking. So whether those deaths happen depends on whether the smokers of today choose to stop. Smoking kills, but stopping works. And I just want to run over a bit of the evidence on that. So here we've got the Million Women study which is a beautiful UK study. It's the best study of smoking and death in women there is. Basically, if women smoke like men, they die like men. And so I'll give the results to women just because we've got a study of a million women here. If you want a study of a million men, you'd go over to America and you'd get some of the results there. So this was a study, this is Valerie Burrell's study of women who've smoked throughout adult life. And even though UK cigarette tar yields have been low in recent decades, they've got big risks. And even the light, back half of the light smoker deaths in middle age caused by smoking. So what are the results of this study? What are the findings in a million women? Remember, if women smoke like men, they die like men. It's, it's not, it doesn't really matter whether you're studying women or men or, you know, black or white or anything. So here's heart disease on the left, stroke on the right. And one is the risk in women who've never smoked. And for the light smokers, they've got three times the risk of dying of heart disease in middle age. Sort of average smokers go about four or five times the risk of dying of heart disease in middle age. And look at stroke. The light smokers got more than twice the risk of dying of stroke in middle age of the non-smokers, and about 
average smoker's got three times the risk. So that's strength of heart disease. And the best known one is lung cancer. So there's lung cancer, but of course that's a rare disease in non-smokers. So yes, okay, the light smokers, I mean, the light smokers have got 10 times the risk of the never smokers, but it's 10 times a small risk. And the average smokers have got 20 times the risk of never smokers. Um, but you know, by the time you're getting to 10, 20 times the risk of never smokers, it ceases to be a rare disease. In fact, lung cancer causes more deaths than any other type of cancer in this country, still after that decrease. And we look at all cause mortality, what's the chances of dying of any cause? Then a smoker, a light smoker, five or ten a day, is twice as likely to die in middle age as a never smoker. And an average smoker is about three times as likely to die in middle age as a never smoker. So that means that two thirds of the smoker deaths in middle age wouldn't have happened if, this, if those smokers had had never smoked a death rate. So we know it's mostly causal. And there's all kinds of nonsense about, you know, other avoidable causes. I mean, yes, certainly things like blood pressure, blood cholesterol, root diabetes, these really matter as causes of heart disease, stroke, and so on and so forth. But you know, the ideas of, you know, stress, worry, you know, lack of some vitamin or other. I mean, there's so much talk about things other than smoking because smoking is old news. You know, there's this thing about stress and responsibility and unhappiness, and the million women see also ask the women whether they were happy or not, and here's the results. You've got happiness on the left and smoking on the right. Are you happy most of the time? Usually, sometimes, rarely or never. Well, the risk is exactly the same. But if you ask them how many cigarettes a day they smoke, the risks are very different. Smoking is real, and most other things that are said to be important are of external causes, just a really of little importance in comparison. Overweight obesity drives blood pressure, blood cholesterol, diabetes. Yes, that matters. But for a smoker, the smoking is a bigger risk than their, than their adiposity. You know, okay, for the never smokers, perhaps your adiposity would be the biggest risk, but it's a lot smaller. Okay, so that's the news about what happens if you smoke and continue smoking. But the good news is that if you stop, then you avoid most of that risk. And that's the key thing. If we want to avoid deaths over the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's got to be by helping those who now smoke to escape from it, to choose to stop and to carry out that choice. And I'll just give one statistic, which is that stopping before age 40, preferably well before 40, will avoid more than 90% of the risk. That it really works, stopping really works. You can do a graph of there's the risk among current smokers, that dotted line at the top, sorry, that dash line at the top, there's the risk among never smokers, there's a dotted line at the bottom at one point naught. And these are the risks among people who stop at about 30, stop at about 40, stop at about 50. And actually, if we'd followed those who stop at about 50 into old age, we'd find that in old age they're doing pretty well as well as the smokers. If you wait until you've actually got a fatal disease before you stop then it's too late. But if you stop before you've got some serious disease, if you stop before 40, say, then you will avoid most of the risk. Um, so it's, it, it, it really, smoking kills, but stopping works. And that's, that's the key thing. Now, obviously we don't want kids to start, but if we want to do anything about deaths before 2050, tobacco deaths before 2050, it's no use going just for schools sure that's going to be very relevant to deaths in the second half of the century in the third quarter the fourth quarter of the century but if we want to do anything about deaths in the second quarter of the century then we need widespread cessation here's uk cigarette consumption um over from 1890 to 2014 there it goes up at the beginning of the century up 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 reaches its maximum in the early 70s this is where ash gets set up just here and then it's gone down and now it's down from nine a day down to about three a day it's gone down by two thirds but that's still a lot of cigarettes left we've managed to knock two thirds off it but we haven't knocked three thirds off it we haven't knocked five sixths off it and it's still the biggest external cause of death we've got and in comparison you know, what's cancer research been achieving i mean i, I speak as somebody who's done cancer research all my, my life you know trying to look at better treatments and so on and so forth and i don't want to mock it in fact i was diagnosed with what should have been a fatal cancer myself and got cured by better treatment. So really, I've got nothing against developing better treatments. But overall, if you look at what cancer rates should have been in men, it's this 
middle line here, this sort of dotted line, look at what was added to that by smoking. You know, back in 1970, when Ashcott set up, more than half of all cancer deaths in middle-aged men were due to smoking. More than half. And that's for the population as a whole. Obviously, in smokers, it's a bigger fraction. And the big decrease in cancer mortality in this country, this is the probability that a smoker, that a person will die from cancer before they're 70. So on the left, males, on the right, females. Actually, look at the female graph, it's sort of rather cleaner. You can see there's the re relatively flat, and then there's a very nice decrease, because of course we've got better treatments of breast cancer now, and various anti various other cancers. Um, and then here's what was added to it by smoking, sorry. I'm trigger happy. Here's what was added to it by smoking, but still, it's about a quarter of all female cancer deaths in middle age and at older ages. And in men, still, okay, it's gone down beautifully. The main reason why cancer deaths have gone down over the last half century is because of the decrease in tobacco-induced cancer deaths. But still, it's a quarter of all the cancer deaths in this country, and slightly more than a quarter in the United States. Um, it's, these are probabilities of death. And of course, when we get to the population, we say how many deaths, then, then we've got some complication because the population in old age is getting bigger and everybody gets old is going to die in old age. Um, so and so the number of tobacco deaths varies. But if, if you look and, and if you want to know about tobacco deaths, then there's a nice graphic of this in the booklet that has um, been prepared for this meeting. OK, but here's total numbers of deaths. Now, this is influenced by changes in the number of people at risk, and it's particularly influenced by the change in the number of people at risk in old age. So the total number of deaths hasn't gone down as much as the death rate has, because while the death rate's gone down substantially, the number of people in old age has gone up, and that sort of contracts it. But still, we've gone down from in 1970, we were running at about 130, 140,000 men dying every year from tobacco. This is middle age and old age, and an increasing number of women, down to about 60,000 of each sex, about 120,000 deaths a year. Well, it's still a lot. It's 20% of all deaths in this country. And, you know, it, it's you know, death in old age matters. We've seen a lot of people killed by COVID in old age, and some people killed by COVID before old age, though mostly in old age. Um, and just overall, just globally, tobacco, HIV, COVID, alcohol in Russia, particularly after the collapse of communism, adiposity, people getting fatter in war, for example, in Rwanda. Globally, these are the only things that have increased substantially since 1990 in some large population. So worldwide or in Britain, these are the big ones. Tobacco has gone down in some countries, Western Europe, North America, although it's still big in Western Europe and in North America. But in China, tobacco deaths are really going up. HIV, well, huge increase in Southern Africa, COVID we all know about. Alcohol was this epidemic of vodka deaths in the 1990s in the former Soviet Union. But these, overall, things are getting better. Overall, death rates are going down. And there's just a few things that are really big and have to be dealt with. And in the UK, the biggest of these at the moment, I think, is still tobacco. It's We've got COVID and tobacco. They're of comparable magnitude. I think in 2020, about as many people were killed by tobacco as were killed by COVID, maybe slightly more were killed by tobacco, and probably the same in 2021. They're comparable. The age distribution is similar, but the attention to COVID, obviously it's novel, it's an epidemic, it's, you know, but actually in terms of the number of deaths, these are comparable. You know, COVID can remind us about what 120,000 deaths a year actually looks like in the country. And that's what we're getting from tobacco. So go back to politics, that's what matters. I just wanted to resurrect the evidence on which those political actions, those political priorities are based. And remember the numbers, 8 million dead over the last 50 years, well, we can't bring them back to life again, 5 million men, 3 million women from tobacco in this country, but there will be another 2 million tobacco deaths over the next 20 years. People who already smoke, and the only way that we're going to avoid those 2 million deaths, we're going to reduce that number of deaths, is by those who now smoke 
choosing to stop. And I don't know what the best ways are of helping them to make that choice. So back to those who do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. So our next speaker and last speaker uh, of uh, the session before the, the break is Deborah Arnott, uh, who is undoubtedly a force of nature uh, and one for which uh, Ashes and the RCP's cause has benefited hugely. She's internationally recognized as an expert on tobacco control uh, and has a particular interest in nicotine regulation and harm reduction. Since becoming the Chief Executive of ASH, she's also been an invaluable member of our own tobacco advisory group uh, and is always advising us on the best way to advocate uh, and campaign and has undoubtedly made us more effective as a college and for that we're very grateful. Uh, today she's going to give us an overview of the challenges that we still face in delivering a smoke-free UK. So 007, over to you. need to see if I can make this work. While I'm waiting for that, um, I'd just like to point to Cancer Research UK and the British Heart Foundation. The funding of ASH at the beginning by government was mentioned, uh, but that funding, while it has been sustained, has not funded our advocacy work. That's been funded by um, the British Heart Foundation and Cancer Research UK, who recognise the work that advocacy to reduce smoking can do in delivering their aims and objectives in tackling heart disease um, and cancer. Um, and I'd also like to extend my thanks to the Royal College of Physicians, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all my fellow directors of ASH, because when I started, I knew nothing about um, not only tobacco, I knew nothing about public health, and it was being part of the tobacco advisory group and part of a community of academics working on tobacco control, which enabled me to get up to speed. Um, I brought with it, with me, the skills on advocacy and campaigning and um, communication. But for Ash, that has to be based on the evidence. And that's the legacy of our founding by um, the RCP. So, am I going in the right direction? No, I don't appear to be. No, I seem to be going back to the slide. What's happened to my presentation? Oh, I've turned it around the wrong way. <laughs> I've always been technically incompetent. I do apologize. Right, now, now we're going. Now, now, now we're getting going. Right, so I'm going to be talking about the challenge ahead and how to meet it, smoking and inequalities. There's going to be a lot of evidence, but there'll be just as much advocacy, and I'd hope you'd expect nothing less from Ash. But I want to start with this, the personal tragedies behind the statistics. When Richards provided us with the total numbers of deaths from 1971 to today, um, we all got talking about what it meant in terms of, of human beings, because those numbers are so big that they're unimaginable. And um, the idea was come up with by people in Ash, not me, and outside, that we should start our own commemorative page for people who've died from smoking. There are many of those for COVID, but actually smoking is just as important. These are the first 19. And we all went out and talked to friends and relatives to see what stories we could get. And I told a friend of mine what we were doing uh, and this is what she told me in her own words. My parents both smoked, and my three brothers, my sister and me, we all grew up to be smokers too. None of us thought it would kill us, but smoking has wiped out nearly my whole family. My parents carried on smoking until their deaths. My dad in 1996, age 64, killed by a stroke, and my mum two years later of emphysema. But their deaths didn't stop us smoking. When my brother Georgie died of lung cancer, aged 50, and Sean of throat cancer, aged 55, they were still smoking. 
Finally, 20 years ago, my sister Sharon and I managed to quit. However, my other brother, Morris, carried on smoking, although after recently being diagnosed with throat cancer, age 61, he's now doing his best to stop. I was in my 40s when my daughter Emma persuaded me to give up. She came home from school one day crying because her teacher said she smelt of tobacco smoke, her books smelt of tobacco smoke, um, her, her clothes smelt of tobacco smoke. She'd never smoked. My husband Frank said he'd quit if I did. I tried and failed on my own. Then I was encouraged to go to the stop smoking services. I never would have succeeded without the help they gave me. That's Lorraine's story. And she's not alone. If you grow up in a family where your parents smoke, you're three times as likely to become a smoker yourself. And smoking is linked to every indicator of disadvantage, what we call the iron chain, linking smoking and disadvantage. I'm not going to read out these statistics, but they're horrific. When you think that the that 13.9% of the population now smoke, but it's above a, a quarter for most areas of um, indicators of deprivation. And for, for the homeless, we're talking about 90%. People die from homelessness out on the streets. They die usually from respiratory disease, and the smoking makes it much more likely that that will get them. So smoking is the key to tackling in inequalities. This is a study by Lawrence Grewer from Renfrew and Paisley. Um, it was a 28-year cohort study looking at what happened to people who quit and who people who um, carried on smoking. What you can see is, across the bottom, I know it's a bit small, I'm sorry, um, are the social classes. And then up the side, you can see whether they're smokers or not. Line is smoking, the green line, is people who quit, and the red line is never smokers. What you can see is there's almost no difference between the social classes. The real difference is whether you smoke or not. So Lawrence's conclusion, and it's a conclusion which has been challenged to me so many times, I don't understand why, by people who see themselves as public health experts, but who, who are obsessed with, the, with the, um, what they call the social determinants of health, rather than thinking about what underlies that. And the conclusion is that the scope for reducing health inequalities related to social position in this and similar populations is limited unless many smokers in lower social positions stop smoking. That's a very important conclusion. And smoking harms not just the length of life, but also the quality of life. This government has a target to increase healthy life expectancy by five years, by 2035. If you smoke, you'll need social care a decade earlier than never smokers. That's reduced quality of life. That means that you need help getting out of bed, walking across the floor. You can't drive yourself. You probably can't even make yourself something to eat. And those are data using national, those are analyses of national data sets for ASH. There are also enormous benefits of quitting to the NHS. We heard about the fact that it's better if you quit before you get sick, and that's true. But actually, something like a third of lung cancer um, diagnoses are amongst people who are still smoking. If they quit smoking, at that point, they can nearly double their life expectancy. So even once you're sick, quitting can help. I won't read through this, but you can see that there are massive benefits to the NHS if we can get people to stop smoking. And it's not just amongst patients. It's actually a major cost to the NHS that a lot of workers carry on smoking. Not so much doctors, but we're talking about, you know, the vast majority of people in the NHS aren't doctors. They're nurses. They're cleaners. Um, they're security people with high rates of smoking, and it imposes significant costs to the NHS through sickness and absenteeism. And we're only just now, as a result of a recommendation in an RCP report, Hiding in Plain Sight, seeing the NHS introduce stop smoking campaigns for its employees. And not just um, health benefits, there's also economic benefits to public finances. Clive, who's in the audience, will remember the PMI-funded study in 2001, which purported to show 
that it was much, be much more beneficial to the Czech Republic if people carried on smoking than if they stopped. It was faulty analysis, uh, and PMI were forced to retract it, although they admitted not that the analysis was faulty, but perhaps, but perhaps that for a tobacco company to say that was a bit um, beyond the pale. But actually, if you look at the costs, because on the one hand, you, yes, you've got money spent on um, um, tobacco going to the government in excise tax, but on the other side, you've got all the productivity losses. You've got NHS costs, you've got reductions in low, uh, local authority social care costs, all from reducing smoking. And they far outweigh the lost tobacco excise tax or the higher spend on pensions because people are living into old age. And an analysis using um, a methodology developed by David Buck now at the King's Fund in the 1990s when he was at the University of York also shows that if we could end smoking, UK job numbers would increase by about half a million. I had some from uh, linked to the IEA say to me that that was absolute rubbish. It's not rubbish. We don't manufacture cigarettes here. Cigarettes go up in smoke. They do nothing for the economy. If you don't spend money on cigarettes, you spend it on other things. But although we have a government ambition for a smoke-free 2030, it's nowhere near in sight. This is a graph produced by the Cancer Intelligence Team at Cancer Research UK. What it shows is, um, if you see the, the, the full line, that's the actual data. Following the trend down is the dotted line. We will not reach um, the target, and smoke-free is defined as smoking prevalence amongst adults of 5% or less, till 2035 for all adults. But for the most deprived quintile, we're talking about 2047. And to go back to what Richard Pito said, if we don't get people to stop, people will carry on dying. So how do we get on track? We have to increase the rate of decline significantly particularly amongst routine and manual workers and the most disadvantaged smokers. And this cannot be achieved by wishing it. It's got to be paid for. We need funding for measures to motivate smokers to quit, and when they do, to use the most effective methods. And we need ratcheting up of tobacco regulation. And George is going to be um, uh, one of a cross-party group of peers to retable amendments, to bring forward recommendations the all-party group has for how to improve tobacco regulation very shortly. And the reason why we need funding is we've seen a significant decline in attempts to quit, and that's gone along with reductions in spend on tobacco control. So in 2008, 40% of smokers tried to quit every year. Ten years later, it was only 30%. That's a quarter less. At the same time, government spend on behaviour change campaigns, which motivate quitting, were cut from 23 million to just over 2 million, a decline in spend in monetary, not real terms, of 90%. And we need to motivate smokers to quit. Recent research by UCL found that there'd been a 25% surge in smoking rates in young adults during the first lockdown. It's tough times. It's hard to quit, particularly amongst young people who've been hardest hit by COVID, not in terms of their sickness, but in terms of the destruction it's, it's, it's had on their lives. And we've also seen a decline in the use of the most effective methods. Funding cuts to local authority tobacco control and smoking cessation have amounted to 33% in, since 2015 in real terms. These are health foundation figures. And since 2013, the number attending stop smoking services has dropped by 74%. Why does it matter? Well, because the success rate of smokers using the services is three times higher than quitting unaided. NICE has estimated that for every pound invested in stop smoking services, £2.37 is saved on treating smoking-related diseases and the reduction in um, productivity losses. There are regions which have bucked the trend, and they're largely in the north of England. Why is that? Because in the north of England, they've invested in regional programs to tackle smoking, which have made up for some of the cuts that have been made at national level. So what we've seen is behaviour change campaigns. 
don't be the one, every breath and 16 cancers. These are things local authorities can't do on their own. They have to be done at regional level, <clears throat> which is where the, the TV stations have their footprint. Uh, illicit trade partnerships tackling demand as well as supply on a regional footprint, as recommended by the NAO. That was started in the north of England, and, and data in the northeast shows significant re reductions in use of illicit tobacco used by the most disadvantaged smokers um, because of those campaigns, which are about not just tackling supply, but also demand. Understanding why people buy um, illicit tobacco and what you can say to them to dissuade them from doing so. And it's not about this being illegal or part of organized crime. It's about it being, this is the way. These are the people who sell cigarettes to your children and you don't want them to smoke, do you? And supporting best practice. Um, so, those regional campaigns have had a big impact. And you can see, highlighted in yellow, they've seen much faster rates of decline. But still, the highest rates of smoking and lowest gross host disposable household income are in the North and the Midlands. So we need to do more. Disadvantage is concentrated. It's concentrated in geographical areas as well as amongst certain populations. What will make the difference? I've already gone through some of the things. We need funding for these, and the funding isn't there. The spending review was a missed opportunity. The public health grant was maintained in real terms, but as the Health Foundation said, this fails to reverse the 24% real term per capita cuts to the grant since 2015, nor address future demand pressures. Tobacco control and smoking cessation aren't mandated services, so they face deeper cuts. Public health funding cuts are equivalent to a reduction of a billion in funding since 2015. Smokers are already coughing up. The Treasury took 10 billion last year in tobacco duty. Tobacco manufacturers made 900 million in profits. Their average net operating profit is 50%. Imperial Tobacco, which sells about a third of cigarettes on sale in Britain, made 71% in 2018. That means for every 100 pound sales, they made 71 pounds in profit. Compare that to most consumer products, which are around 12 to 20%. FedEx, 6%. Why should they be allowed to make such excessive profits? And it's smokers who suffer. They spent 15.6 billion on tobacco, half a million households in poverty because of the cost of smoking. So the solution is the polluter pays levy, which George has already referred to. It's already in place in the USA where they have a user fee scheme. The industry pays something like um, well, 700 million, maybe a few more millions of dollars every year to pay for tobacco control. As the CMO said recently, a small number of company, companies can make profits from the people who they have addicted in young ages and then keep addicted to something they know will kill them. If we limited tobacco industry profits to 10%, it could raise 700 million a year. That would more than pay for tobacco control and help fill the yawning gap in public health funding. In 2015, the Treasury consulted on a levy but decided it wouldn't work because the manufacturers would just pass the cost on to um, the consumer. Now we've left the EU, that can be prevented. We can fix prices and profits and prevent the industry from passing them on. It would also mean that the Treasury would still get its 10 billion. It's the excess profits that would come to tobacco control. And it would incentivize tobacco manufacturers to make smoking obsolete. So that's our priority for the future. We have a track record together, and together with the RCP, the public health community. We've secured so many things. Uh, and as Bob Blackman pointed out in Parliament, when amendments to the Health and Care Bill on tobacco were going through, these were secured by backbench MPs working in collaboration with the public health community. Together, we can and we will secure a polluter pays levy. Without the levy, we cannot pay for the measures needed to achieve a smoke-free 2030. Millions of smokers have paid with their lives. Now big tobacco must pay to end the epidemic. And I wanted to end where I started. 
These are the people we're doing this for, the people who died prematurely and the people who will die in future prematurely if we don't end smoking. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So we're now going to have a short break uh, and then we will reconvene uh, probably in about 10, 15 minutes for the second half of the program. Uh, so anybody watching at home, please use the opportunity and there's drinks at the back for those here. Thank you. <laughs>